I'm Connor Woodman, and I used to work in the City of London putting together deals worth hundreds of millions of pounds. But I'd had enough of e-business done on a computer screen, so I quit. <laughs> I've sold my flat and I'm using £25,000 of the profit to trade my way around the world. It's brilliant, I can't believe it. I'm staking my savings in real markets, face to face against hardened traders. <laughs> so forget the stock market meltdown and property crashes, money's still flowing here day in, day out. Thank God for that. It's the way people used to do business, buying something and travelling with it and selling it in another place. This is exactly what it's all about. I hope to make some serious money. <laughs> but if it goes wrong, I could lose the lot. Five months into my journey and I've done deals in Africa, Asia and the Far East with some incredible success. I was on fire selling African chilli sauce to the spice-loving Indians. <laughs> Definitely hot. Definitely hot as well. <laughs> I imported South African reds to the emerging Chinese wine market. Very nice. Um, for me it's very full-bodied wine and made my biggest profit so far. But in the Far East, I invested in niche products with big margins and bigger risks, and my luck ran out. I failed to sell some rare vintage tea and an expensive piece of jade. Oh, I'm sick of going into shops. It was nothing short of a disaster. I lost a fortune, and my running profit has fallen to just seven grand. My next destination is South America, but before I leave Asia, I need to find something to take with me. Mexico's tourist industry is worth £6 billion a year, and I want a product I can sell to people on their holidays. There's tons of companies in China making those kinds of products, but I think I've found the right one. I've discovered a factory in China that makes inflatable bodyboards ideal for holiday makers because you can roll them up and fit them in your suitcase. Hi. Ah, 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 thank you very much. You yeah. make uh, inflatable surfboards? Yes. Let's take a seat. Take a seat. Mr. Liu is the factory owner and proud of his ingenious product. It's good and uh, robust. How much? 50 years to ours. No, but seriously, if I was ordering a thousand, what would they be each? He's not particularly impressed by an order of that size. I need another angle if I'm going to get the price down. How much business do you do with Mexico? Not yet. Not yet? Yeah. Okay, you give me a good price. I'd take a thousand of these to Mexico, uh -huh. sell them to a customer there, and then give them your details, bring you two together. Yeah. So in the future, you um, do business straight with a customer in Mexico. I see. OK, yes. That's done the trick. Okay. Yes. Mr. Liu drops his price to £6.75 a board. I'm wary of risking more than £5,000, so we settle on 750 okay. boards. Good man. Excellent. Uh, I think it should be a good start. I hope that there are Now all I have to do is sell them. For the final leg of my journey, I'm heading to Latin America. It's my last chance to make decent money and avoid the humiliation of going home penniless. I'm planning to take advantage of the booming tourist industries. I'm in Mexico because it's got some of the best beaches in the world. It's by far the biggest tourist industry in Latin America. Should be the perfect place to sell the surfboards. I can't think of a better way to see the Mexican countryside than in an open top beetle. I've decided to start in the beach town of Puerto Escondido because it's a mecca for surfers. I want an endorsement for my surfboards from someone who really, really knows what they're talking about. And out there, on the Mexican pipeline, are the best surfers in the world because this is the biggest shore break in the whole world. So if I can find one of those guys out there to say that my surfboards are really good, 
Well, then I can use that to convince any potential buyer here in Mexico that they're exactly that. Angel Salinas is a champion surfer who's been riding these waves for 34 years. Getting my boards endorsed by him could significantly boost their value. And as Angel owns a chain of surfing shops himself, I'm also hoping he might buy some. You never seen one of these before? Never. I know this is a professional surfing beach. Do you think surfers would get into this kind of thing? I try. I let you know. OK, right, right, right. <laughs> The waves here can reach six metres. Seeing how the average solid surfboard is faring, I know it's going to be the ultimate test for my inflatable boards. I can't wait to get out there now. We need to swim out beyond the point where the waves break. It takes me 40 exhausting minutes to force my board through the oncoming surf. Now I just have to get back again, riding the biggest wave I've ever seen. Unbelievably difficult. Honestly, nearly drowned. You've got to go through a wall, an absolute wall of water. It just comes crashing down on top of you. It's a terrifying wave. But not for a pro like Angel. He seems to be doing fine. You all right, Angel? Yes, I am fine. I enjoy it. <laughs> what I think is, uh, is something new. Something new for the kids. So It's uh, like a new toy. For big waves, it doesn't work. So this is kind of for beginners to average surfers? For beginners and for kids. Great. So I'm the proud owner of 750 children's beach toys. You want to buy some for your shop? Um, yeah, I will. I will. <laughs> okay. yeah. That's right, man. I'll, I'll give you some. Yeah. The good news is, Angel's happy to endorse my boards, and he even offers me some advice on where I should be selling them. Where are the kind of people that are going to use this board? I would like to say uh, Acapulco, because the way he has less power. There are a big, uh, big place. For Escondido, it has just 60,000 people. Yeah. Acapulco, maybe uh, 2 million people. Right, I'll try and sell them there. Yeah, for sure, you're going to do fine. Thanks, Okay. Man. Thank you. I mightn't have sold any boards here in Puerto Escondido, but at least I know where my target market is now. Time to hit the road. I'm in Mexico trying to sell 750 inflatable bodyboards and I'm heading up to the best known beach resort on the Pacific coast. Everybody knows Acapulco. I mean, you know it from the song or you know it from the movie. It's, it's a famous, very famous Mexican tourist resort. Mexican people go there, American people go there, Europeans go there. If you're trying to think of where you can sell 750 surfboards, well, it couldn't be any better than Acapulco. 228 miles up the coast, Acapulco attracts 6 million tourists every year and consequently some of Mexico's biggest retailers. I've set up a meeting with uh, a guy called Alejandro, who's the vice president of a, a big retail chain called Marty. And if he makes the decision that the price is right and he likes the boards, he could buy them all, which would be absolutely fantastic. Would also be a first. Including shipping costs from China, my bodyboards have cost me £8 each. I'm aiming to sell them here in Mexico for around £14. This would give me a fantastic £4,000 profit, if I can get my asking price. Marty's a huge chain of 118 stores which sell sports equipment throughout Mexico. Crucially for me, that includes a range of beach products. Okay. Gracias, gracias. Check out the big boss. That's who I've come to see. It's a big store, isn't it? Wow. 
Marty clearly attracts the family market that I now know my board should appeal to. Nice to meet you. Nice Welcome. to meet you. Thank you very much. Great store you have here. Thank you. Well, Alejandro Gomez is vice president of the Marty Group. I have, um, I have a product I've brought all the way from China that okay. I'd like to uh, try and convince you to stock here. Okay, well, uh, you have it with you? I have it with me, I have it okay. with me. Well, well, let's take a look at it. He already sells standard boards, so I'm going for a double whammy. Mine are half the price and much more suitable for holiday makers. You can tell straight away it's packaged in the same kind of way you'd package a tent or a sleeping bag, something that you go camping with. It's very lightweight. Okay. It's the kind of thing you can throw into a suitcase. Okay. okay. But the great thing about it, gone is that problem of having something that you then can't yeah, take home with. Yeah, definitely. You. Okay. It rolls up, comes with a pump, comes with a leash, and you just inflate it and it's ready to go on and the way. And that's about it. To be able to carry it around, it's, uh, it simplifies everybody's life. I mean, it's good. And how much are they? <laughs> That's a good question, right? That's always a good question. <laughs> <laughs> the price I had in my mind was, was 14 UK pounds. That's 280 pesos. 280 pesos. Where it's expensive, but uh, we can do our effort. <laughs> and what does that mean? I mean, we can get them, yes. You can work on 280 yeah. pesos? I mean, I would like to, to work on uh, 250 pesos, but... Why keep me in the middle? 265 pesos. Okay. Delivered to Mexico City? Yeah, no problem. Deliver it to, yeah. It's easy to make business in Mexico. <laughs> it's too easy. If you have I haven't even finished pumping it up yet. <laughs> <laughs> 265 pesos is £13.25. Still a 100% markup. I can't quite believe how easy this seems. Um, so, seriously, we have a deal? Yeah. Well, great. We should. That. that it was easy. That was very easy. I'm wishing now I'd bought more than 750 boards. But hindsight's a wonderful thing. Well, that is absolutely fantastic. What a result. God, I was so worried about being in another situation where I was going to be left with a load of stuff that I couldn't get rid of. And it was so simple. I don't know if everything just came together in the right time or what, but oh God, I was so thrilled when he said, fine. And we shook and brilliant. Couldn't be better. It's a good product. I mean, and, and the price is it's, it's not the best price, but uh, it's a reasonably good price. Money in the back, money in the back. I'm really happy. I bought my bodyboards for just over £5,000. I spent almost £1,000 on shipping and I sold them for 10 grand, giving me a profit of £3,887. Now that deserves a drink. It's the perfect way, I think, to start this leg of the journey. I can't think of a better product that I could have brought to Mexico at this time of year. Now I'm kind of confident again, I'm ready to go on to the next trade. It feels as though I'm back on track. Dealing with the tourist industry has worked out well for me here. So I decide to do some research on other trades that will help me tap into that market. As night falls, I've begun to formulate a plan. But the place that I desperately want to go to is Brazil because it's the biggest market in Latin America. And in Brazil, Rio is, is the biggest tourist resort there. There's loads of bars and the product that I think I could sell there, that I can buy here in Mexico, is tequila. It turns out all tequila comes from the area around a small town of the same name in western Mexico. It's big business. 120 million bottles are sold worldwide every year. As I arrive in town, I can see already there's no shortage of competing brands. And it's really intimidating. If I'm going to come out of this with any profit, it's vital I make the right choice. 
Well, it's obvious just riding in here, there are hundreds of tequilas for sale in the town of Tequila. It's mind boggling. There's, obvi there's white ones, there's um, gold ones, there's aged ones. There are signs everywhere. I think to find the right one is going to take a little bit of research. I clearly need to know more about this product, but my investigations will have to wait until tomorrow. It's 5am and in the hills around town it's harvest time. This plant, known as the blue agave, is the raw material for making tequila. 300 million of these plants are harvested every year. Jose Cortez grew up working in the fields around town. These guys are the harvesters called jimadores. And with this tool, which is called coa, they cut the pricking leaves off. So what they get is the heart. You see that? You see how you see this? The juice? Yeah, that smells like oh, uh, tequila. tequila already. It's just naturally fermented. It's naturally fermented. That is amazing. You can try it if you like to. I need a bit of salt and some lime. <laughs> Lemon. <laughs> it might it might taste like alcohol or it, it might taste, taste like alcohol. like uh, it tastes like for breakfast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a bit early for me. The matureness of agave mm -hmm. has to do with the quality of the tequila. In order to get uh, an agave mature, you need to wait between seven up to nine years. And if you don't wait, well, you would have a very, very cheap tequila. In terms of producing a quality product then, what you're saying is that it's absolutely key that you start with a, a quality agave plant. That's right. Okay. That's right. Back in town, I've got a decision to make. Do I buy a small amount of a top quality brand or lots of a cheaper mixing brand. I've got no idea what the difference is, so Jose offers me a tequila masterclass. This is tequila blanco herradura. This is the strongest tequila in Mexico. This is the only one which is 46% alcohol. There isn't a shot glass in sight. For Mexicans, quality tequila should be sipped just like a good malt whiskey. So where did this idea that you just throw it back come from? I don't know whose idea was that, but uh, that's not the right way to drink it. It takes time to enjoy tequila. Sip. How come you go like that? Why is that? How come I'm like that? <laughs> because it burns. It doesn't burn. Maybe you've got no taste buds left. <laughs> <laughs> but you like it? Yeah. And I definitely like the marketing angle that buying the strongest tequila in Mexico would give me. So I put in a call to the head of Herradura, the distillery that makes the brand. So what's the best price that you would do? 40. So $40. 20 pounds a bottle is much more than I was expecting. I understand that you're trying to build a brand for Herradura which is all based on quality and the price has to reflect that. But unfortunately, I've got probably three or four days in Rio and what I need to get is a quick sale. So what's crucial for me is that I get a really low price so that the bar owners there, you know, will just bite my hand off. I think probably the price is going to be too high. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, bye, bye. I'm beginning to think that for once, quality isn't what I'm looking for in a product. I'm worried that no one outside of Mexico will pay extra for a premium sipping tequila. I think I'm far better just going with something that people can put in margaritas, they can drink as shots, but crucially comes at a very, very low price. My next tequila drinking session gets off to a promising start. Margarita inside the glass. 
salud. Delicious. Truly, truly. <laughs> yeah. Delicious. At Del Senor Distillery, they make a whole range of tequilas. I'm only interested in their cheap mixing stuff. People in Brazil are pretty a bit like me. They don't really understand tequila. But this, everyone understands that. Because it yeah. just tastes great, you know? It just yeah. tastes good. So, you know, I can convince people to buy into that easy. What is the cheapest, cheapest, lowest possible price that you could sell this to me for? Cleared in Brazil. 10 US dollars per bottle. 10, 10 US dollars per bottle? Yeah, pretty cheap. That is pretty cheap. Yeah, absolutely. It's almost nothing. It is almost nothing. That is a really good price. And I think, yeah, I think you got a deal. <laughs> deal? Deal. Deal, right. <laughs> there it is, Sombrero Negro. Yeah. Five pounds a bottle is a fantastic deal. At that price, I'll be able to adopt an aggressive undercutting strategy in Brazil. I've only got a few days to sell it all, so I buy a modest 400 bottles of Sombrero Negro for £2,000. He's going to make a lot of money in Brazil because we have a best, the best product to make like a margaritas or any cocktail you want. I think that went really, really well. I think it ticks all my boxes. It's a genuine, authentic Mexican product. It's made in a traditional way. But apart from that, at that price, it's easy to sell that into a market where people make cocktails from tequila in the same kind of way that I enjoy drinking tequila. You know, in a way that people outside of Mexico enjoy tequila. It all makes sense. I feel very positive indeed. Rio de Janeiro, Brazil's carnival city, is where I think I've got the best chance of selling my 400 bottles of tequila and making a fat £2,000 profit. I feel a bit naughty selling hard liquor in Rio, with him sort of watching over me. <laughs> it sort of feels like you shouldn't do it. Putting my Catholic guilt aside, I need to get rid of this tequila fast, as I only have four days here. Four days to sell all this tequila seems tough and 400 bottles seems like a lot, but I reckon it's just about a small enough amount that I can go direct to the bars, the restaurants, the clubs here, get just below the radar of the big distributors, and if I can make a fraction of what they make, I'll be more than happy. The neighbourhood of Lapa is famous for its nightlife. I'm certain there's got to be some tequila drinkers here. But it looks like I'm not the only one who thinks so. <laughs> it's amazing! Everywhere I turn, there's a guy with a bottle, lime and some shot glasses. It's like a constant barrage. Another one! Oh, everywhere! I'm just amazed how much tequila there is on the streets of Rio. It's like every every ten seconds someone's offering you tequila and it's it's really interesting because it's one particular big brand, Cuervo Gold. They're ramming it down your throat. And it's a real problem for me. Because when people think tequila now here. There's only one brand in their mind. No one here has ever heard of Sombrero Negro, but somehow I need to get these people to switch brands. <laughs> See how you get on with that one, son. <laughs> oh dear. Hopefully bar owners will be a little more open-minded. Do you sell tequila in your bar? Yes, I sell tequila here, but uh, another kind of tequila. Which is which... that? Cuervo. Cuervo. Uh, every, Cuervo. Everybody, Do you know? Everybody knows. Knows. Everybody yes. knows. You wouldn't like to try a new brand? No. To see if your customers like it? No. Even if the price was very good? No. Even if, if I paid you to take it? 
you still can if take you it. pay if you pay it yeah. to me yeah i cannot uh, accept you still this can't take it. no because this franchise work only jose Cuervo. if every bar in rio is like that and they've all done exclusive deals with the big companies who are already here well then i'm totally stuffed there's no way i'm going to be able to sell any of my tequila this is going to be tougher than i thought I've had enough for one night. My name's Connor Woodman. I've quit my job, sold my flat, and I'm using 25,000 pounds of my life savings to trade my way around the world. I'm going home in less than three weeks, so the pressure's on to make some serious money. I was hoping to make 2,000 pounds profit selling tequila in Rio but I've come up against a big brand that dominates the market. It's my second morning here and I've still got all 33 cases of tequila. I've realized my only hope is to target bar owners who are not tied into exclusive deals with Cuervo. Even they have been seduced by the market leader. I work with another tequila, Cuervo tequila. But you gotta understand that people really don't know Sombrero Negro, they know more than yeah, Jose Cuervo. Yeah. You sell tequila here already, right? Yes. You got Cuervo. I gotta tell you, we're not very kind to traveling salesmen. <laughs> <laughs> Jose Cuervo has the market name, has the brand name. Even when I get them to agree to a taste test, bloody Cuervo comes out on top. Correct. All is not lost. A slavish loyalty to the one big brand isn't the only thing these bar owners have in common. It's also clear none of them can resist a bargain. <laughs> How much is the bottle for? Going for? Well, the price of each is 30 reals. Which I think probably compares pretty well with what you're already buying. No, oh, that's a really good price. I mean, what we pay for Jose Cuevo is around 35 right. reais. So it's, we're talking about, what, 12? 12% off, that's pretty good. 30 reals is about 10 pounds. Fortunately, I got such a good deal in Mexico buying at only five pounds a bottle that I can offer this amazing price and still make a 100% markup. Bill. Bill. <laughs> the price would be 30 reals, that's 10 pounds per bottle. Yeah, okay. for me it's good, yeah. for me it's good. That's okay, good. That's thank good. you sir, <laughs> thank you Neil. Yeah. If I you 30 for the bottle, you'd snap my hand up. Oh, it's easy. Easy? It's easy. Easy, easy? Easy deal? Easy deal. Easy. Thanks, man. Easy deal. Thank you very much. Done. Done? Done. <laughs> Over the next three days and nights, my undercutting strategy looks like it's paying off. Yeah? Yeah. It seems that no matter how popular the brand, okay. money talks. Good man. Have we got a deal? We got a deal. Buying cheap tequila in Mexico was definitely the best decision I could have made. It's my final morning in Rio, and even though things have been going well, I've still only sold two-thirds of my tequila. I've got to say I am knackered. I've been going door to door selling tequila now for three days. Today's my last day. I've got to get rid of the rest of this tequila before I go, and maybe I could even... Maybe I could even hit the beach for an hour. Sadly, the beach will have to wait. With 10 cases left to sell, I'm off to meet a buyer from a big chain of bars. It's my best chance to get rid of the remaining tequila in one shot. OK, so you're by far the biggest fruit I've seen. What I really want to find is a big customer and uh, maybe, uh, maybe it could so. be it. <laughs> Let me show you the tequila. OK. So the tequila is... Um, wow. Del Senor Sombrero How Negro. How you know this tequila? How much is the tequila? One bottle is 30 real. OK. Which I don't know how, how that compares with the tequila you already buy. Your price is really good. It's really good? Yeah, it's really good. So. Maybe I can make you an offer. Okay. Okay. Like uh, 96 bottles. That would be eight cases. Yeah, for 25 reels. Say 25 reels is about eight pounds. 
it would still give me a 60% markup, but I really need to persuade her to take all 10 remaining cases. I'm quite happy to work with the price 25. Okay. If you could take the 10 cases. 10 cases in there. Instead of eight. It's only an extra 10. Okay. It's only two more. <laughs> 24 bottles. You've got nine bars. It won't take you any time to sell that. Okay. It's a deal. It's a deal. I'm a very happy man. I'm a very happy Me man. Me too. I can't wait to, to get in the evening. It's brilliant. I can't believe it. There's 33 cases tequila sold in three and a half days. Half a day to spare. How often has that happened on this trip? Never before. Four days to sell all this tequila. It's pretty impressive. I bought my tequila for £2,000. My shipping and travel costs came to £300 and I sold it for £3,800, giving me a profit of £1,500. After nearly six months on the road, I can hardly believe it's time to start thinking about my final trade. I want it to be a big one, so I need to find a really good Brazilian product to take back and sell in the UK. I've been on the phone to a friend of mine back home who runs a fund, and he's told me about a company that actually make their money out of chopping down trees in Brazil, which you might think is the ultimate sin, but the great thing about this is that it's 100% sustainable. I think an environmental product like sustainable timber could be a real money spinner in the UK. Call me a cold cynical bastard if you like, but the fact is people do pay a premium back in the UK for ethical products. At the end of the day, I'm here to make money and if that product is sustainable and that equates to more pounds and pence on my balance sheet, well, then it's ideal. So I'm leaving Rio and heading 1,200 miles northwest deep into the wilds of Mato Grosso. getting down there in the time that I have is in this, which is brilliant. It also gives me a bird's eye view of my next potential investment, plantation teak. Sustainable teak isn't widely available in the UK, so if the wood here is up to scratch, I could fill a profitable gap in the market. On the other hand, there could be a very good reason why no one is already importing it. Good flight. Good flight, yeah, thanks. What an amazing place. How remote, in the middle of nowhere. Florist Taker, the timber company I've come to see, has bought up thousands of acres of deforested ranch land and used it to plant Burmese teak. The sustainability of their plantations has been independently certified. In the company's nursery, rows and rows of saplings are being intensively grown. Manager Hugo Del Fuego shows me around. How many cuttings would you say you have? Around six million. Six million? Teak is a durable hardwood with a high market value. And if that was fully grown, about $1,000 for a tree. Yeah, around this value. Can I keep this? <laughs> that means there's potentially three billion pounds in this nursery alone. In the UK, the value of ethical shopping is doubling every two years. The question is, will this teak be the right product for me to tap into that market? The company operates on the outskirts of the Pantanal region, a tropical wetland and wildlife sanctuary. I think when I go back to the UK that selling this teak is going to be about more than just the wood itself. It's about the whole story and the whole project that goes with it. And not only do Forest Taker make sustainable teaks, but it all operates in this incredible Pantanal area. If I can convince consumers back in the UK that by buying Brazilian teak, then in some way preserving all of this, well then they might just pay a premium. 
As night falls, I've made my mind up. What I've seen today has convinced me to take a huge gamble. I think I've seen everything I need to see here. The product is perfect. I am prepared to put every penny that I've made so far on this trip into this product so that when I get back to the UK, I'm selling something I really believe in and you know, the stakes are high, but potentially I could make a lot of money out of doing this. I think I can make at least 10,000 pounds selling this teak back home, but only if I can get it at a decent price. The next morning I return to the Flores Taker plantation. Today I'll face the most important negotiation of my trip so far. Silvio Coutinho, the vice president of Flores Taker, has agreed to meet me to thrash out a deal. My best bargaining chip is that the company currently have no UK customers. So I will try and find customer in the UK who's going to buy into that sustainable, ethical consumer model and pay a little premium for it. Sure. Now, if I do this trade this time, you will want the direct relationship with that customer in the future. Definitely, yes. Okay. So, if I'm going to be the person that goes and finds you that customer, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm going to ask for. Yeah, 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 I know. I need a really good price. Yeah. I think it makes sense to give, a, let's say, a discount for this. Our minimum prices that we would work for that is around $1,400. Right. This is... Silvio is offering me $1,400 per cubic metre of timber, which is around £700. It's a good offer, but I think I can push him for an even better discount. Can we go $1,200? Yeah, this is a bit hard, you know, because you, you proposed 1200 I offered you 1400 I think uh, 1300 barely covers our costs. Yeah, At that much. price, I'm prepared to go for broke and buy a lorry pounds. load. Including parking, shipping, it means parting with nearly £13,000. I'm offering you a very good deal. That's a good price. Yeah. Yeah. All right. This, okay. is, a, this is a partnership, I think. Yeah. That's it then. I've just invested nearly all my profit from five months of hard work on trees. I've got such a good deal that if all goes well, I should be able to double my money on this trade. Then again, if I can't sell this wood back home, I could lose it all. It's so weird seeing this being loaded onto the truck now and from here to the port, it really kind of brings it home to me that this is the end, this is the end of the travelling. All of my profit is tied up in these piles of wood and uh, to think that if I don't manage to sell it, that whole thing would have been in vain. I'd better bloody sell it, hadn't I? It'll take two months for my teak to be shipped to the UK during which time the world goes into financial meltdown. It's put my final trade and all the money I've made so far in serious jeopardy. Having traded my way across 16 countries, I'm finally back home in London. My teak has arrived at Tilbury Docks on the Thames at the start of the recession. Right, okay. well done. My timing couldn't have been worse for trying to sell a luxury product. It's quite daunting to be here with a quality product at the economy in a terrible time and to have so much of it. On the upside, I still think that introducing a sustainable Brazilian teak to the UK market is a great business opportunity. I've got one company who I think really are genuinely interested in this. 
So plan A is put it on a lorry, drive it down there, show them it, hope to God that they do like it, and then negotiate a good price for it. And if that goes smoothly, brilliant. If that doesn't go smoothly, I honestly have no plan B. Let's hope the company I found are equally keen on plan A. Based in the Cotswolds, Benchmark work with top designers like Terence Conran and specialise in handcrafted furniture. Here we are. I've got to say actually, I was quietly confident about this um, all the way, but now that I'm here, I've got a little, a little knot of apprehension in my tummy. Time to break the seal and open my container. Well, it's wood. For Sean Sutcliffe, the company's boss, my wood could re-establish the use of teak in his business. We haven't used it in this workshop for a very, very, very long time. Because it's not, because it's not it's sustainable. It's not sustainably produced. Right. And there's almost nobody in the whole of the UK who's dealing in it at the moment. What it's probably perfect for is for garden furniture, you know, outdoor applications, and that's what we want. This is sounding promising. I want to double my investment, so I'm asking Sean to pay £25,000 for my container of teak. It's more than I'd hoped. I mean, it's fair to say I'm not going to want to pay that much. Okay. Now, I've got to sell furniture in a climate that is a lot tougher than it was a month ago or two months ago, and a lot tougher than it was four months ago. Yeah. After several hours of negotiation, I can hardly believe how far he's knocked me down. I've dropped seven grand to just over 18. We're still three grand apart. Yeah. But it seems that's still not low enough for Sean. That's, I mean, that's an enormous discount that I'm giving you on it. But it's only a discount from an imaginary price. I don't believe you. I think it's worth more than I'd, that. I wouldn't buy it. Honestly, I wouldn't. This obviously isn't going to work. I'm gutted. He just seemed determined to offer me a ridiculous price. And I know that wood is worth more than that. And I couldn't, hand on heart, end this long journey by getting rolled over like that. There's no way. So I'm going to have to go and find another customer. Aren't I? If I can't, I'll lose everything I've worked for. I've got a container full of teak to sell and no buyers. Yeah, my name's Connor Woodman. I'm calling about some teak that I've actually imported to the UK. Oh, hello. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm calling up about um, some teak. Can I talk to somebody there about some teak? At this stage, you know, really, I'm trying to get an idea of, of, of what it could be worth. After a day on the phone, I've lined up a couple of meetings with companies who are keen to have a look at my sustainable teak. The New Dawn Furniture Company in Hampshire hand makes environmentally responsible furniture. It's run by Dennis Wingham. Dennis. Hiya. Connor. Hi. How are Pleased you? Yeah, Pleased to meet you. What do you think of that? I think the texture is uh, really, really brilliant. Nice colours, nice texture. I must say it's brilliant to have sustainable teak in my workshop. We can produce furniture from that quite easily. I know this is a small company, so Dennis won't want to take all the wood, but I'm hoping I can get a decent price for whatever he does buy. The bottom line is you're happy, you're happy with that? Yeah, I'm quite happy with the project. Yeah. £1,000 a cubic metre. Yeah. Yes. Done? Yeah. Deal. Done, Dusty. Good man. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> what a result. Dennis practically Excellent. bites my hand off, buying half <laughs> my wood for a total of £13,500. <laughs> Getting the price we have here, it gives me a start for the new season and be able to hold my prices into a situation where we can survive through this recession. I feel brilliant that he's paid a fair price for it. And by doing a little bit of extra legwork, I'm quids in and I'm very happy indeed. But I still have to get rid of the other half of the wood, so I'm off to my second lead in Nottingham. Wood Newton is a construction company that specialises in environmentally friendly housing. John Green is the managing director. I think the, the quality of the wood, the tartness of the grain, the, uh, the, the amount of knots in it is very, very minimal, so it's a uh, great material. 
first time we've seen eco-friendly tea yet. So to bring that in uh, into the marketplace will be very beneficial for us. So, what, 13 grand? Um, Hold up. 10. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna play this game, are we 12? Um, it's a rainy cold day, you meet you halfway. 11. <laughs> <laughs> Go on then, I'll meet you in the middle, 11 Thank and a half. Deal done. All right. Yes, the end, the end, there it is. The last trade, it's all finished. It is absolutely brilliant to be back, you know, in my own country with something that I've brought from the back of beyond and find that there's a great market for it. And crucially, you know, to make that final profit and the biggest profit that I made probably on the whole journey. It couldn't have ended better. I bought my teak for £11,620 when the pound was worth $2. I spent £1,000 on shipping and sold it for a total of £25,000, giving me a profit of £12,345. After an epic trip spanning six months and 16 countries, trading in everything from camels to coffee, I've doubled my original £25,000 investment. I lost money on camels, horses and vintage tea, but made up for it with great profits on wine, surfboards, tequila and the teak. And although I failed miserably to sell my jade, an expert in London says it could still be worth between 10 and 15,000 pounds at auction. Very well skillfully carved. Finished, the end of the road. How exciting to be back in the city of London where I used to work. When all said and done, I've made about £25,000 on this trip. Even allowing £5,000 for travel costs, that's 20 grand profit, which isn't bad. It feels very strange to have finished and to have achieved what I set out to do. But I think this journey has been more than just a financial success. In six months, I've been on the trip of a lifetime. And, you know, I've, I've learned so much about how people do business all over the world. I think like a lot of people in the city, before I went on this trip, I thought I knew everything about the economy and business and how to make money. And I think what I've learned on this is that there's an awful lot more to it. Business is about making money, but it's also about people and relationships and culture, and it affects every part of our society around the globe. The pursuit of money really is what makes the world go round. It's been, um, it's been an eye-opening experience and I feel like a very different person indeed. For an interview with Connor and an interactive map of his journey, log on to channel4.com and search for 80 trades. Next, Rams is off to Hollywood and the health food eatery Santa La Brea, but who's the boss? Gordon kicks butt in Kitchen Nightmares USA.